The facts from the case file of the 1962 Alcatraz escape are tangled up in evasions and cover-ups from the initial investigation. Telephone calls, postcards, and letters were paraded as evidence, but they were nothing more than a masquerade. Sightings of men on rafts and men resembling the escapees in New Orleans, Washington, D.C., Rio de Janeiro, and Canada added to the mystery. Then there were the mysterious veiled women and bearded men who showed up at family funerals. All this and the enduring myths perpetuated by movies urban legends, and rumors of boat pickups by accomplices have made the 1962 escape from Alcatraz one of the most enduring mysteries of the 20th century. Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary, commonly known as The Rock, was a maximum security prison located on Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay. The prison operated from 1934 to 1963 and housed some of the most dangerous and notorious criminals in the United States, including Al Capone, George Machine Gun Kelly, and Robert Stroud, also known as the Birdman of Alcatraz. The island eventually housed 280 cons and about 250 civilians. Alcatraz gained its reputation as one of the toughest and most secure prisons in the world due to its location on an isolated island harsh living conditions, and strict security measures. Now let's take a look at the key players in this case. Frank Lee Morris was an extremely smart and handsome guy with an IQ of 133. Born in Washington, D.C. in 1926, Morris had a troubled childhood and began committing crimes at a young age. He was known to read extensively and had a talent for drawing. Morris was considered an ace at escaping from prisons. Having previously escaped from the Louisiana State Penitentiary and the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, he was also hard to figure out. According to Officer Mills, he was a shy, neat, and nice-looking young man. If someone had been asked to pick any inmate at Alcatraz who was likely to make a run for it, Morris would have been his last choice. But that sounds like a profound misreading of the man. Morris had made escape his life. Escaping from nearly every prison in which he'd served time, and the fact that officers did not even suspect him tells us how good he was. At Alcatraz, he quickly earned a reputation as an intelligent and resourceful inmate. John Anglin and Clarence Anglin were brothers and co-conspirators in the 1962 Alcatraz escape. The older of the two brothers, John, was blonde-haired and blue-eyed. Clarence, a year younger, was taller and heavier, with dark hair and hazel blue eyes. In 1958, they were sentenced to 35 years in prison for robbing a bank. Due to their repeated attempts at escaping from prisons, they were eventually transferred to Alcatraz. I would like to mention an important point here. Before coming to Alcatraz, the brothers were known for their swimming abilities. They used to amaze their family and cousins by swimming in the frigid waters of Lake Michigan as ice still floated on its surface. Alan West was born in New York City on March 25th and has a history of trying to escape from prisons. During one escape attempt from the Florida State Prison, he held a gun to the associate warden's head, stole his car keys, and escaped in the man's car. He was later captured and transferred to Alcatraz in 1957 at the age of 28. At Alcatraz, he talked constantly to the other inmates about escaping from the prison. In June 1958, Alan West arrived for his second stint at Alcatraz. In January 1960, Frank Morris arrived at Alcatraz in the cell next to Alan. On October 3, 1960, John Anglin was transferred to Alcatraz. And finally, in January 1961, Clarence Anglin also arrived at Alcatraz. On the night of June 11, 1962, all of them except West escaped from Alcatraz. When we look at their previous histories along with their escape attempts, it looks like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle perfectly fitting together. And once they were together, they stayed together set into motion a chain of events that would later be remembered as the greatest escape ever from the world's toughest prison. Frank Morris, Alan West, and the Anglins planned their escape for more than a year. After their escape, investigators wondered which one of them had masterminded the plot. Though West claimed responsibility for the idea, he was the only one left behind to tell his story and had a reputation for bragging. Experts say that with West's eighth grade education, he probably would not have been able to concoct a plan as sophisticated as the one the men executed. Morris was the one with the highest IQ and a history of staging sophisticated escapes. Plus, 
Investigators found articles on how to make life jackets and boats in Morris' cell, not West's. However, West was instrumental in arranging the resources because it was his second time at Alcatraz, and he knew a lot of the inmates and officers there. Whoever devised the plan, it started with a ventilator shaft. There were eight of these ventilators in the prison ceiling, but only one of them was not cemented closed. Once the four men learned about it, they realized that if they could somehow climb up to the top of the prison and remove the ventilator cover, they could get out onto the prison's roof. West was assigned to clean up after a plumbing crew installed hot water faucets in cells. While doing so, he saw water heating pipes that he thought could be used as a ladder because they extended all the way to the top. How would they open up the vents without any tools or any of the guards noticing? Morris's first thought was to burn through the concrete by using an electric cord attached to the cell's ceiling light socket, but it did not work. They realized they would have to dig the vents open. Every day during a happy hour between 5.30 and 9.30 p.m., the men began chipping away at the concrete around cell vents. Using the sharpened ends of spoons they had stolen from the mess, they created tiny holes, which they later combined to form bigger and bigger holes. Once the men had made a few holes in their vents, they would use wet toilet paper, smoothed over with soap chips to cover them. After many nights of digging, the concrete was finally loose enough for Morris to pull out the grill. But that left a gaping hole. Using pieces of cardboard from the prison art supplies, he cut out a rectangle the exact size and shape of the grill. On it, he drew the precise crisscross pattern of the grill and painted it the same shade of green. When he was finished digging each night, he would simply slide the entire fake grill into place. Each escapee did the same with the grill in his cell. But just to be safe, Morris left his concertina case in front of the vent. John Anglin hung a long raincoat in front of it. The grills were finally big enough for the men to squeeze through, but they could not just leave their cells empty and needed decoys. To make models of themselves, it required hair, which Clarence Anglin was able to steal from his job at the prison barbershop. The first dummy head the Anglins made was constructed of rags covered with soap. Clarence added the hair he stole from the barbershop to the top of the head and used it to form eyebrows and eyelashes. The half-head was so ugly, the men jokingly called it oink. Next came Oscar, a more complete and human-looking head, molded out of toilet paper and soap to form a homemade plaster. When the men sneaked out of their cells, they left the dummy heads on their pillows and stuffed rolled-up blankets and clothes under the covers to form the shape of their bodies. While prison life went on as usual, Morris, West, and the Anglins were creating a whole other industry inside Alcatraz. There, they made their very own workshop, where they assembled all of the tools they would need to escape. To get off Alcatraz, they would have to survive the frigid waters of the bay, which meant they would need boats and flotation devices. Morris had read an article in Popular Mechanics magazine that taught him how to make a life jacket. He constructed the life jackets as well as two 6 by 14 foot rafts using the waterproof 55 navy raincoats that they had traded with other inmates. To inflate the raft, Morris removed the keys from the concertina he bought from the prison and used it as a bellows. To steer the raft, Morris crafted wooden paddles. And to enhance the durability of the life jackets and rafts, Morris applied a technique developed by Charles Goodyear in the 1830s, known as vulcanization, which uses heat to toughen rubber and render it more resistant to tears. To navigate the dark, frigid waters, Morris fashioned his own flashlight, utilizing two pen light batteries and a small rectangular plastic box containing a bulb on one end. A metal fastener conveyed the electricity from the battery to the bulb. In the spring of 1962, Clarence Anglin was the first person to climb the pipes to the top of the cell house to reach the ceiling vent. What he discovered was disheartening. The ventilator, their route out of Alcatraz, was covered with a cap attached by solid metal screws. Clarence tried using a wrench made with clasps taken from his bed, but he could not loosen them by hand. Here, West proved resourceful. When he learned that the prison's vacuum cleaner had broken, he offered to fix it. Much to his surprise and delight, he discovered that inside it was not one but two motors. West fixed one motor and removed the other. To this motor he attached drill bits, and using this, 
they were able to wriggle the screws free. On the night of Sunday, June 10th, 1962, Morris sent word out to the rest of the men that tomorrow was going to be their day of escape. On the night of June 11th, 1962, after the lights went out for the night at 9 p.m., the Anglin brothers and Morris placed the dummies in their beds, sneaked out of their cells, and went up to the vent. Out of the four men, only Wes had not finished opening the hole in the back of his cell because some cement still needed to be removed from the edges to make it large enough for him to crawl through. While West was working on it from the inside, Clarence tried to break the hole open from behind the wall using a pipe provided by Morris, but it made too much noise. Despite feeling panicked, West continued to work on removing the remaining cement. Meanwhile, the Anglin brothers were restless and anxious about missing their chance to escape, so they decided to leave West to finish on their own and proceed with their plan. At around 10 p.m., Morris pulled open the cap to the roof vent. Inside the West Gun Gallery, an officer heard the noise. It sounded like a person hitting the end of an empty 50-gallon oil drum with the heel of his hand. The officer reported the noise to the lieutenant on duty, who went to investigate inside the prison but didn't find anything. They rushed across the rooftop, but in their haste, they dropped one of their paddles and left behind a spare life vest and raft. When they reached the other end of the roof, they descended a 45-foot pipe on the outside wall of the prison kitchen. But John swung too hard, causing a second loud noise heard by guards at 10.45 p.m. By 11 p.m., Morris and the Anglins likely reached the water's edge, where they assembled their raft, inflated their life jackets, and waded into the water. After loading their supplies into the raft, they pushed off into the darkness. West continued to dig furiously at the back of his cell. Finally, at around 1.45 a.m., he was able to break through, and upon reaching the roof, he found it empty. West stood there for a few moments, possibly thinking of what could have been done. Then he climbed back down the shaft, crawled back into his cell, and got into bed. He had been left behind. On the morning of June 12th, at 7.15 a.m., Officer Lawrence Bartlett did his routine head count along the B block. When he tried to wake a sleeping Clarence Anglin, the prisoner would not budge. He yelled for Lieutenant Bill Long. Lieutenant Bill, I have one. I can't wake up. Long went down to Anglin's cell to investigate. He reached his left hand in through the bars, hit the pillow and hollered. The head flopped on the floor. When the head rolled off the bed and struck the floor, and the alarm was sounded. Following the Alcatraz escape, extensive search efforts were conducted in the air, on land, and in the water. The officers discovered their workshop, where the escapees had crafted their tools. Bloodhounds were employed to trace the men's path, which led down to the water's edge but stopped there. Interviews played a significant role in the FBI's investigation, and West, who had been involved in the plot, was their most valuable witness. In fact, West was eager to share his knowledge with the FBI. He was bitter about being left behind. According to West, the plan involved paddling north to Angel Island, taking a break, and then swimming through the Raccoon Straits and reaching the shores of Marine County, where they intended to steal a car, rob a clothing store, and then go their separate ways. However, authorities were unable to find any corroborating evidence to support this theory over the next few weeks. Several important clues were found on June 12th. Robert Chech is from San Francisco, said that at 1 a.m. on the morning of June 12th, he saw an illegal boat in the bay near Alcatraz. A few minutes later, the boat left, heading under the Golden Gate Bridge. This led to speculation that the prisoners might have enlisted outside accomplices to pick them up. The FBI dismissed Checky's account. On June 12th, a homemade wooden paddle matching the one used by the escapees was found floating approximately 100 yards off Angel Island. On June 13th, a woman from San Rafael called the police, claiming to have seen a raft with three men aboard floating approximately 10 miles north of Alcatraz. When the FBI investigated, the three men turned out to be fishermen. On June 14th, a packet made out of raincoat material was found floating. Inside were several sheets of paper and photos that featured the Anglins and some of their friends and relatives. On the same day, a life jacket similar to the ones used by the escapees was found on Cronkite Beach. On June 18th, 
A postcard was received at Alcatraz addressed to Warden Alcatraz Prison and signed by Frank, John, and Clarence saying, We made it. Handwriting analysis proved that Clarence did not write the postcard, but it was unclear whether one of the other two men might have written it. On June 22nd, a life jacket with brown stains on it was found off the east side of Alcatraz. The ties used to fasten the life jacket were still there, and the inflation tube had teeth marks on it, suggesting that someone had been trying to keep it inflated. On June 27th, the associate warden of Alcatraz received a call from a man claiming to be Frank Morris, who said, I guess you're glad to know that I'm alive, but hung up when warden asked personal questions. Ultimately, Alcatraz became too expensive to maintain. On March 21, 1963, the government abandoned it as a federal prison. If you've enjoyed this video so far, please do me a huge favor and hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you all for your support. Now you will ask, could they have survived? Many experts believe there is no way they could make it to the shore. Shortly after the escape, Assistant Director Fred Wilkinson from the Federal Bureau of Prisons said the tides and winds that night were strong, and these convicts were not the athletic type. Only a trained athlete could make such a swim. Yet several people have made the very same swim since then, including a couple of grade school children, proving that it would not have been impossible. In July 1962, a Norwegian ship called the Norafell spotted a body floating in the water wearing prison-issued pants, approximately 20 miles northwest of the Golden Gate Bridge. The sailors did not report it as they were on their way to Canada and had no radio. The following month, the officer reported the sighting to the FBI, but it was too late, as in a 2014 study by scientists at Delft University. It was concluded that if the Alcatraz prisoners had left the island at 11.30 p.m. on June 11th, they could have potentially made it to Horseshoe Bay, and any debris would have floated towards Angel Island, where some of their belongings were found. However, if they had left earlier or later than that time, the tides and currents would have made their chances of survival unlikely. Testimony from guards confirms that the prisoners put their raft in the water around 11 p.m. On November 30, 1993, an interview with former bank robber Thomas Kent aired on America's Most Wanted. Kent added new details about the escape, saying that Clarence Anglin had arranged for an old girlfriend to meet them on the shores of Tiburon and drive them to Mexico. From there, they were headed to South America. FBI records do show that Morris bought a Berlitz Teach Yourself Spanish book. In 2003, the television show Mythbusters tested whether the escapees could have made it to shore. The crew constructed a raft following the prisoner's model and successfully rowed it from Alcatraz to shore. The experiment showed that it was possible to escape from the island in such a raft. The FBI wanted to know how far the men could have gotten while wearing their life jackets. To test their water resistance, the FBI reinflated the life jackets and then put weights on them as pressure. Ironically, all three life jackets stayed airtight, although they lost air within an hour. But the leak was slow enough that the men could have kept themselves afloat by blowing into the dipstick. According to a 2011 documentary by the National Geographic Channel entitled Vanished from Alcatraz, old FBI files mentioned that on June 12, 1962, a raft was found on Angel Island with footprints leading away from it, but no further information exists or has been released to the public. On the same day, a 1955 Chevrolet California license plate, KPB 076, was reported stolen in Marin County. A claimant was corroborated by similar news in the Humboldt Times and the San Francisco Examiner, although it was not reported to the FBI. On June 13th, the next day, a motorist in Stockton, California, 80 miles east of San Francisco, reported to the California Highway Patrol that he had been forced off the road by three men in a blue Chevrolet. Now let's take a look at some of the theories. The biggest conspiracy theory surrounding the fate of the inmates is that the trio survived the daring escape. But in the half century since they vanished, other theories have attempted to explain where the men went into hiding and their activities since. U.S. Marshal Michael Dyke, who inherited the unsolved case in 2003, said that he didn't know whether any members of the trio were still alive. But he had seen enough evidence to make him wonder. 
That evidence included credible reports that the Anglin's mother, for several years, received roses delivered without a card, and the brothers attended her 1973 funeral disguised in women's clothes, despite a heavy FBI presence. A 2015 History Channel documentary entitled Alcatraz, Search for the Truth, presented Christmas cards containing the Anglin's handwriting. While the handwriting was verified by the Anglins, none of the envelopes contained a postmarked stamp, so experts could not determine when they had been delivered. An alleged photo of the Anglin brothers hiding out in Brazil, about 13 years after they vanished, was shown during a special on the History Channel that aired in 2015. Fred Brizzy, a friend of the Anglins, claimed to have run into the brothers in Rio de Janeiro in the 1970s and took this photo. Forensic experts working for the family confirmed that the photos were taken in 1975 and asserted that the two men were more than likely the Anglins, although the age and condition of the photo and the fact that both men were wearing sunglasses hindered efforts to make a definitive determination. Art Roderick, a retired U.S. Marshal, called Breezy's photograph of the two men. This is absolutely the best actionable lead we've had in January 2020. An Irish creative agency and AI specialists at PHI used facial recognition techniques to conclude that the men in the photo were indeed John and Clarence Lynn. On his deathbed in 2016, a man named John Leroy Kelly made a confession to his nurse, claiming that he and an accomplice were involved in helping three inmates escape from Alcatraz. According to his confession, the two men were waiting on a white boat in the bay, and they picked up the escapees as they paddled towards the shore. The group then traveled up the coast to Seattle. Interestingly, this account corresponds with a report by Chechi. Chechi had noticed a white boat with its lights off in the marina on the same night as the prison break. Although it appeared empty at first, the boat later shone a spotlight on the water before disappearing into the night. If we recall, the FBI had dismissed his account. In January of 2018, a letter emerged. It was allegedly written by John Anglin. My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June 1962 with my brother Clarence and Frank Morris. I'm 83 years old and in bad shape. I have cancer. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. If you announce on TV that I will be promised to first go to jail for no more than a year and get medical attention, I will write back to let you know exactly where I am. This is no joke. It went on to say that Clarence died in 2008 and Morris died in 2005. CBS San Francisco reported that it obtained the letter from an unnamed source. In 2013, the FBI tested the letter for fingerprints, but the results were inconclusive. It's difficult to believe that they had no plans after putting their raft in the water and simply drowning. Considering that the Anglin brothers have been extremely good swimmers since childhood, even if their raft somehow sank, they would have been able to swim. Based on the conditions that night in the bay, according to scientists, they would have been able to stay afloat for two hours. This gives them ample time to reach San Francisco, Angel Island, or Horseshoe Bay. On top of that, we know that they had fully functional life jackets, so the scenario of drowning seems less likely. Officially, their raft was never recovered, but from old FBI records, we do know that such a raft was found on Angel Island. Considering the level of detail used in their plan, they could have also dropped that boat and packed it with photos to mislead the FBI into thinking that they had drowned. The FBI conducted a thorough search of the whole bay with ships, helicopters, and divers, but still no dead body was found. Once we look at all of these details, I think that the boys made it safely to the shore despite facing difficulties. Now what happened once they reached the shore? We know that a car indeed had been stolen, but theft wasn't reported to the FBI. They successfully made it to Brazil and lived the rest of their lives there. Morris was a free soul who left the brothers and went on his own, but they did stay in touch as per the letter in 2018. Frank Morris died in 2005. Clarence Lynn died in 2008. If that letter was indeed written by John Lynn in 2018, and he was terminally ill at that time, then due to a lack of proper treatment, he must have also died by now. Did they survive or not? No matter which side you are on, we all agree that they will always be remembered for the greatest escape ever. Here we have reached the end of our story.
If you enjoyed it, don't forget to support us with a like. And if you're not a subscriber yet, subscribe now and hit the bell icon.